Good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Precision Drilling Corporation 2023 third quarter conference call. I would now like to hand the conference over to Levon Sadunik, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Welcome to Precision's third quarter earnings conference call and webcast. Participating on today's call with me will be Kevin Nevue, President and CEO, and Carrie Ford, our CFO. Earlier this morning, Precision reported strong third quarter results, which Carrie will review with you, followed by an operational update and outlook commentary from Kevin. Once we have finished our prepared comments, we will open the call to questions. Some of our comments today will refer to non-IFRS financial measures and will include forward-looking statements, which are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties. Please see our news release and other regulatory filings for more information on financial measures, forward-looking statements, and risk factors. As a reminder, we express our financial results in Canadian dollars unless otherwise indicated. Before I pass the call over to Kevin and Carrie, I would like to remind listeners of our CWC Energy Services acquisition, which we announced in early September. This acquisition will position Precision as the premier well service provider in Canada and bolster our drilling operations in both the U.S. and Canada. With the acquisition, Precision adds to its marketed fleet 62 service rigs and 7 drilling rigs in Canada, plus 11 drilling rigs in the U.S., which includes 7 AC triples. We expect this acquisition to close within the next couple of weeks and generate a creative cash flow on a per share basis in 2024. With that, I'll pass it over to Kerry. Thank you, Levon. Precision's Q3 financial results reflect the resiliency of our high performance, high value business model and organizational focus on cash flow and return of capital, meeting our expectations for adjusted EBITDA and further strengthening our balance sheet. During the quarter, adjusted EBITDA of $115 million was driven by healthy drilling activity, improved pricing, and strict cost control and included a share-based compensation charge of $31 million. Without this charge, adjusted EBITDA would have been $146 million, which compares to normalized EBITDA of $126 million in Q3 2022, an increase of 16%. Margins in Canada were higher than guidance, resulting from stronger than expected pricing and cost recoveries, higher ancillary revenues, and improved cost performance. In the U.S., margins were lower than guidance, largely due to an increase in operating costs driven by increased repair and maintenance costs and lower fixed cost absorption, as we're maintaining higher overhead in anticipation of increased activity in the first part of 2024. In the U.S., drilling activity for precision averaged 41 rigs in Q3, a decrease of 10 rigs from Q2. Daily operating margins in Q3, excluding the impacts of turnkey and IBC, were 11,941 U.S. dollars, a decrease of 1,563 U.S dollars from Q2. For Q4, we expect margins, excluding the impacts of turnkey and IBC, to be in line with Q3 margins in the 11,500 U.S. dollar to 12,000 U.S. dollar range. In Canada, drilling activity for precision averaged 57 rigs, a slight decrease in two rigs from Q3 2022. Daily operating margins in the quarter were 13,913 dollars, an increase of $1,830 from Q2 2023. For Q4, our daily operating margins are expected to average over $15,000, an increase of over $1,000 from Q3 levels due to ancillary winter equipment and improving prices. We continue to build our North American contract book with Q4 2023 drilling rigs of 57 under take-or-pay term contracts on average for the fourth quarter of 2023. In addition, we recently signed several term contracts for work commencing early in 2024. Internationally, drilling activity for precision in the quarter averaged six rigs. International average day rate for 51,570 US dollars, an increase of 3% from the prior year due to rigging. We recently activated our fourth rig in Kuwait and expect the fifth rig will be activated in the next few weeks. We expect earnings in our international business to increase approximately 50% from 2023 to 2024. Moving to our CMP segment, adjusted EBITDA this quarter was $14 million, <laughs> down slightly compared to the prior year quarter with 10% fewer well servicing hours 
offset by higher pricing and margin. Moving to the balance sheet, we are committed to reducing debt by over $500 million between 2022 and 2025 and achieving a normalized leverage level of below one time. Our debt reduction target for 2023 is $150 million and we plan to allocate 10 to 20% of free cash flow before principal payments directly to shareholders. During the quarter, we reduced debt by $26 million and have now reduced debt by $126 million year to date. Upon closing the CWC acquisition, we will assume CWC debt, make cash payments to CWC shareholders, and incur transaction costs, all totaling in the $60 million to $70 million range. Despite incurring these cash costs, we still expect to meet our annual debt reduction target of $150 million, pointing to robust cash flow expectations in the fourth quarter. As of September 30th, our long-term debt position net of cash was approximately $915 million, and our total liquidity position was $621 million, excluding letters of credit. Our net debt to trailing 12-month EBITDA ratio is approximately 1.7 times, and our average cost of debt is approximately 7%. We expect our net debt to adjust the EBITDA ratio to be below 1.5 times by year end, with net debt of approximately $900 million and a run rate interest expense of approximately $65 million. Our full year 2023 capital plan has increased from $195 million to $215 million, largely a result of signing term contracts with upgrade capital paid back inside of the term of the contract. For several of these contracts, we received cash up front from the customer. Additional annual guidance for 2023, which does not consider impacts from the CWC acquisition, includes depreciation at $290 million, and SG&A at $90 million before share-based compensation expense. We expect cash interest expense to be approximately $80 million for the year and cash taxes to remain low with an effective tax rate of approximately 25%. Year to date, we have had share-based compensation charges of $22 million. As previously stated, we expect our 2023 share-based compensation expense to range between $20 million and $40 million for the share price range of $60 to $100 with the potential to increase or decrease another $15 million based on relative share price performance and a multiple between zero and two times. With that, I will now turn the call over to Kevin. Thank you, Kerry, and good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm pleased with our third quarter results with improved revenue and cash flow compared to the same period last year, despite lower industry activity in on North American markets. I commend everyone in Precision's organization for their precise execution and safety excellent operational performance, strict financial discipline, and the continued focus on cash management, which was demonstrated across all precision business segments during the quarter. I continue to be very encouraged by the support of commodity price fundamentals, but also by the strict capital discipline evident across this industry. And this discipline begins with the investors' expectations for shareholder returns and a continued insistence for industry capital discipline. Our customers are functioning very well in this environment, they are not responding to short-term commodity price signals or volatility. They are managing budgets and staying well within cash flow. And most importantly, they're focusing on efficiency and performance. And nowhere is this more important than our Canadian segment, where broad industry activity is down 6% during the third quarter compared to last year, as our customers remain highly disciplined, staying within fixed budgets. Yet, our 29 super triple rigs are fully utilized this year compared to 25 at the same time last year. And a reminder, we'll be adding one more super triple to our fleet on January 1st through an upgrade we announced late last year. Today, we're also running 32 super singles, and this would be the highest Q3 utilization for this rig class since early last decade. <clears throat> In light of the high super spec rig demand, we have customers anxious to commit to firm, take or pay term contracts securing rig access. Currently, our Canadian book includes 27 rigs under term contracts, and 17 of those have two-year-plus terms. And I remind you that in the Canadian market, term take-or-pay contracts were traditionally exceedingly rare. Notably, we recently booked several customer contracts, which include pad walking and depth extending upgrades. And those rigs are required for the winter 2024 drilling season. And this necessitated increasing our current year capital budget, as Terry described earlier. I'll also reiterate uh, Kerry's comments that the capital will pay back within the contract period and the enhanced margins will continue for the duration of the rig's operational life. 
Also, for several of these contracts, customers uh, provided us with advanced cash payments up front as we work hard to minimize our cash outflows. Our outlook for Canada remains uniquely strong. Early in 2024, two major hydrocarbon pipe projects will be started up. The Coastal Gas Link pipe set to deliver natural gas to the LNG Canada project and Trans Mountain expansion, adding almost 700,000 barrels per day of oil export capacity. For Canada, these projects are absolute game changers, resulting in significantly improved upstream commodity prices for our customers, deep bottlenecking production, and providing global market access for Canadian energy. Now, I see these independent projects as complementing each other. And that is to say that the liquid condensate produced by the Montney gas wells is sold commercially as diluent to the heavy oil producers to enable heavy oil shipping through pipelines. So this significantly improves the economics for the Mountainy gas producers who are ultimately focused on the LNG exports over the longer term. Concurrently, the increased oil export capacity of TMX will serve to reduce the Western Canada Select price discount significantly improving economics for heavy oil customers. So for precision, the result is that the natural gas drilling in the Montney is growing to meet the imminent needs of LNG Canada, and heavy oil drilling has rebounded to levels not experienced since 2014. And all of this is evidenced in our record super triple demand and our strong super single demand. So this is truly a game changer for precision's Canadian drilling market. With term contracts providing revenue stability, reduced seasonality with pad rigs drilling throughout breakup, market visibility extending beyond seasonal commodity price volatility, and all of these factors setting us up to deliver sustainable shield returns commensurate with our asset base and providing opportunities for further expansion in our Canadian footprint. Today, we have 68 rigs running, actually up one from our press release, which was reporting yesterday's activity. They expect to be in the low 70s before the Christmas pause. Customer planning for winter suggests a strong and fast start to 2024, with customer demand exceeding 23, 23 levels. And we look forward to the addition of the CWC drilling rigs and crews, and we expect that Precision's combined activity this winter could be up 10 to 15% from last year. Leading edge day rates for our super triples are now in the mid-30s, and for our conventional super singles in the mid-20s, while our pad-equipped super singles have now moved up into the low 30s thousands per day range. In particular, excess customer demand for Precision's Alpha equipped super triple rigs is seemingly in the range of seven to 10 additional rig opportunities we're considering. I think the likelihood that we secure a customer paid redeployment of at least one or two super triples from the US to Canada later next year is increasing. With our super singles, the demand tends to be more seasonal with winter being the peak season where demand could outstrip our rig availability by 10 or more rigs. So we expect these market demand signals may lead to additional opportunities for customer funded upgrades or pad drilling and longer reach horizontal capabilities and certainly stimulate further customer interest in take or pay term contracts so they can secure access to the rigs. Now turning to the lower 48, the capital discipline I've described in Canada is at work in every U.S. basin. In the near term, it's meant that natural gas drilling has slowed down over the course of 2023, and the increases in oil targeted drilling we expected earlier this year have failed to materialize as our customers continue to tightly manage their drilling budgets. However, we continue to see customers optimizing drilling efficiency by high grading rigs, focusing on pad drilling, and extending lateral lengths. This focus on efficiency is also continuing to drive customer interest in our Alpha Automation Platform, our Alpha Apps, and it's driving interest in our evergreen best battery energy storage systems and other diesel fuel saving solutions. Today, we have 44 rigs operating in the US and seem to be in the trough. Customer indications uh, and interest uh, indicate an increase in activity as budgets reload for 2024. And we expect to see some of these rigs activated later this year. During the third quarter, we continue to experience strong customer interest in our alpha equipped super triple rigs since the beginning of the year, we've added five public ENPs to our customer list and increased our share with two others as we transition to more oil-based work and less private company exposure. Now, super spec rig supply remains in tight availability. During the third quarter, we secured a paid upgrade commitment from a customer to cover the cost of increasing the horizontal depth capability of a precision super triple. And during the year, we've executed 12 other similar upgrades. 
And these upgrades include enhancements to the mud pumping capability, the drill pipe racking capacity, and targeting longer reach horizontal wells. And some of these also include evergreen enhancements to improve the fuel efficiency of the rig. And we expect to see more of these customer paid, up, paid upgrades uh, emerging in 2024. Rig pricing and leading edge rates remain stable as the most capable high specification rigs remain in tight supply and pricing discipline remains a core strategy across the super spec land market industry. I'm very excited to add the eight CWC rigs and crews currently operating in Wyoming. And we see the Powder River Basin as an excellent opportunity for precision to expand our US operations in 2024. Now turning to our international business, as Kerry mentioned, we activated our fourth rig in Kuwait during the third quarter and expect the fifth rig to start up in early to mid-November. Both rigs are activating several weeks later than we previously got it, and these delays were entirely due to client planning delays, not precision issues. The capital spending to reactivate those rigs is largely complete, and the five-year contract for each rig will commence when the rig begins operations. By mid-November, we'll have all five rigs in Kuwait operating and three rigs in, in the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Arabia running for a total of eight rigs, and we'll continue to bid all five idle rigs for opportunities across the Arabian Gulf. <clears throat> in our well servicing segment, Canadian industry well servicing activity notice, noticeably slowed during the third quarter as our customers digested the cost increases related to services inflation, labor costs, and material costs. We see a backlog of previously planned activity building up, and are now beginning to see a significant increase in activity and expect this to continue with the next year. I'm also very encouraged by the strong performance we see in the CWC Well Services Group and look forward to integrating uh, the people of CWC and their operations into our business later this quarter. So to wrap up my comments today, I'm thrilled that despite a weaker market than most would have expected, Precision is on track on all three strategic priorities. We also created the financial flexibility to execute a meaningful Canadian consolidation transaction, and we continue to have the flexibility to invest in our fleet to be customer-backed rig upgrade opportunities. And with that, I'll now turn the call back to the operator for your questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a question or a comment at this time, please press star 1-1 one, one on your telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to move yourself from the queue, please press star 1-1 one, one again. We'll pause for a moment while we compile our Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Aaron McNeil with TD Cowan. Your line is open. Afternoon, and thanks for taking my questions. Kevin, I can appreciate that there's a lot of value in keeping your promises on the debt reduction, you know, especially in light of the, the track year record over multiple years. But sort of putting that aside, how does debt reduction compete today for capital with the NCIB, uh, given the pre uh, prevailing valuation? And how should we think about that in the context of your strategic priorities for next year? Yeah. Go ahead, okay. Jerry. Aaron, uh, so I'll take that one. You know, debt reduction still remains front and center, and, and we've put out very specific targets for 2023 and then the two years following this year. Uh, so we're committed to doing that. Uh, as we have more free cash flow, uh, we, we should be able to expand the amount that we allocate towards share repurchases. You know, this year it's 10 to 20 percent of our free cash flow which would, would put it kind of in the 15 to $30 million range of share repurchases. Uh, next year, if our cash flow outlook improves, we, we should be able to increase that. Got it. And I, Carrie, I know you gave guidance for Q4 margins in the U.S. in your prepared remarks, but I'm hoping you can sort of give us a better sense of the moving parts. I mean, you mentioned the higher staffing levels. You mentioned R&M. Like, how much of that was – you know, I don't want to call it one time, but maybe of normal and what's sort of recurring. Yes. So I think if you think about Q3 and Q4, uh, top line, there won't be a whole lot of movement. And, and the costs that we incurred in, in Q3, a lot of those will repeat in Q4. So that, that goes into the margin guidance that, that we provided. As Kevin mentioned on our Q2 call, we were going to have the rig count kind of moving up and down a little bit around this kind of low 40s level. And that means there's a bit more uh, rig churn than we typically have, um, which causes a little, little bit more cost. And as I mentioned, we're carrying a, a bit more overhead 
than we uh, typically would at this activity level because we do think that activity is going to increase. But for your guidance, I would point to um, you know a similar operating cost in Q4 that we had in Q3. Got it. Okay. Thanks. I'll turn it back. Thanks, Jeremy. Our next question comes from Luke Lemoyne with Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Kevin, I believe you talked about seven to ten additional opportunities in Canada, and maybe you can move one to two U.S. Super Triples into Canada. Uh, when you're looking at opportunities like that, are these kind of two-year terms that you're targeting to make the move from the U.S. to Canada, or how are you thinking about that? Luke, that's a great question. And it's a real important strategy question for us uh, as we think about it. And, you know, some of these opportunities might not be for full year work. It might be for the winter or maybe for the summer. So we'll we'll look at that very carefully and determine what we think is best. What we look for, though, uh, number one, is that the operator needs to be paying a leading edge market rate. We've in the past talked about that being around $37,000 per day. We've talked about the operator uh, needing to pay the full mobilization cost. And you can think about that being around a million dollars to move the rig up and get it ready to work in Canada. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, requirements we'll have on our customers if that rig's going to move up. Uh, but we also don't want to be a situation where we oversupply the market. So we'll think very carefully to make sure that we think it's sustainable work and that um, there's a long horizon of work for that rig. So we'd want a contract that was one to two years in duration, but we'd want to have good visibility and work beyond that. Uh, now, what I'd say is that with the LNG project coming on right now in Canada, uh, we are expecting additional rig demand to meet the requirements of that project. And uh, that's why we're targeting kind of something like one or two rigs we think the market can probably handle. And, and perhaps we're like, maybe it can handle a third or a fourth rig. We'll, we'll take it one by one. Okay. And then just still in Canada, I believe CWC has some non-utilized rigs. What's the outlook on those going back to work? Um, so their fleet is primarily uh, what are classified as tele double rigs. Those are generally shallower rigs uh, that are triples and uh, maybe a little deeper than some of our super singles. They're commonly used in central, southern Alberta and Saskatchewan. It's an area that uh, Precision hasn't uh, had a lot of focus in the past. We've been really focused on the resource plays, the conventional uh, heavy oil and the Montney. Uh, but we'll certainly uh, bring the CWC team on, ranks it to see how uh, uh, they've worked, uh, you know, they've been very effective in the winter season. They've had often all of those rigs running during the winter, all six rigs running quite commonly. So, uh, you know, to see us running all six CWC rigs and maybe pulling through a few more of the precision tele doubles would be a very good outcome. And we think that the uh, sales team from CWC can bring uh, some uh, strong market intelligence on that market segment for us. Okay. If I could sink one more in real quick. Um, on the U.S. side, I think you said you have 44 rigs operating and some could be reactivated later this year. You know, we've seen momentum, you know, the Inveris count the last few weeks, especially on the Permian, just on a daily basis. Where do you think kind of your rig count could be maybe, you know, six months from now or three to six months in, in the U.S., just kind of based on conversations you're having and what you're seeing? Yeah, you know, I think um, we'll be in a fresh budget year come January, and certainly we've already got uh, customer indications there'll be more rigs going to work. You know, we're playing that against – uh, a couple of these large uh, acquisitions that have been announced recently between Exxon and Chevron. You know, you know, everyone knows that, uh, you know, three plus two equals four, not five. So there's going to be a slight rig count reduction with those transactions. Uh, but other EMPs right now, they're looking to replace ducks and kind of get back into uh, ensuring they can sustain production. Uh, it does feel like rig counts are moving up next year. Uh, you know, whether that's 50 or 75 rigs is a bit hard to project. But if we picked up our share of that and what we see um, in our pipeline right now, adding the um, the eight rigs that are operating right now with CWC, we can have a rig count, you know, back in the low 60s pretty quickly. Okay. Um, perfect. Thanks, Kevin. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kurt Halid with Benchmark. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, Kurt. Um, hey Kevin, I know uh, you guys referenced here on the on your press release and, and your commentary, you know, about a potential doubling of profitability in the international uh, market. Um, is that uh, you know you're, it looks like you're adding what one one plus rig, you know, one and a half two rig on average, you know, going into into next year. So 
doesn't seem like it's going to be all volume driven per se. So is, is there a significant step up in, in kind of day rate and cash margin you expect from, from these rigs that you're going to be bringing online? So, Kurt, there's a couple things there. We're, we're going to average a little bit less than six rigs this year. And then next year we'll average eight for the full year. Uh, the, the two rigs that we're adding are higher margin than the other rigs that are, that are running, um, on, on average. And we also incurred a bit of cost reactivating these last two rigs that, that won't recur next year. So mixing all of that together, we think that's, uh, an increase in, in 50%. Now that's a 50% increase. It's not a doubling in, uh, in EBITDA. It's uh, just a 50% increase. We're going from six to eight with a bit more profitability. Okay, that's great. Appreciate that clarity. Um, and then, Kevin, uh, kind of follow up for you as you referenced the, you know, increased uh, term contract dynamics happening, you know, in in Canada and, and you know, 27 rigs now on on term contract. Um, I, you know, crystal ball it. You know, in the next one to two years, given the dynamics around you know, LNG and, and heavy oil, as you met, referenced, uh, what what do you think that 27 could become? Uh, you know, I have to preface everything with macro. Uh, you know, the macro can affect um, everywhere all the time. But assuming the macro doesn't have some, you know, massive shift like a pandemic or another war, but, but we're dealing with um, the Canadian market as it sits today with uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline coming on, and uh, the coastal gasoline project, and, and then likely uh, follow-on approval of uh, phase two for LNG Canada. So if we're running 30 rigs today, that could be uh, as much as mid-30s, three or four years down the road. Uh, could even be a low 30s just by the end of next year. So we could see that rig count go from 30 to 32 or 33 next year. And uh, you know, up beyond that could be 35 or it could be 40 rigs kind of down the road. I don't think we're building new rigs. Uh, I think we've got opportunities to upgrade existing rigs like we did for the one rig we're moving into Canada on January the 1st. Uh, you know, to give you a sense of the capital needs for that, we could probably upgrade a, one of our older SER rigs to a full super spec for the range of 10 to $15 million, far less expensive than uh, building a new winterized rig. So I, I don't think um, uh, we would need a ton of capital to see our rig count in Canada go up. Quite a bit if the LNG projects continue as they look and uh, and heavy oil continues to remain strong. That's great. Really appreciate the color. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Keith McKee with RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, first question is just on the U.S. Now, Kevin, we know that your rig count um, over the last year or so had been more private company weighted and you talked about adding six public companies this year and increasing your share with two just curious what do you think is the right customer mix for pd in the u.s in terms of publics private etc and and what do you think needs to happen in order for you to get there yeah keith i think that that sort of changes with time a little bit i do think that uh, as u.s lng uh, exports start to ramp up in 2024 and 2025 uh, we might be a little less uh, worried about, uh, you know, private equity style E&P companies if they're drilling for gas if there's a stronger LNG export market. So if I look back at, you know, FY 2020, FY 2021, having that private company exposure and gas exposure was excellent for precision. Now, at this point in time today, having more public company exposure, having exposure to the majors, super majors, having more oil exposure is what we're targeting. And we're delivering on that. It's not, you know, we can't make these changes in a week or two. It takes a quarter, two quarters, three quarters. But our customer mix at the end of this year will look vastly different than it did at the beginning of the year. And I'm really pleased with the progress our sales team is making on that. Yeah, got it. Appreciate the color. And and maybe one for Carrie. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of uh, maintenance capex per rig or maintenance capex per day? Uh, I guess more specifically on, on your U.S. fleet. Has there been much inflation from that 1500 a day level that we used to always quote, or, or where are things trending there? Yes. So there has been inflation. We had quoted on, on prior conference calls that, uh, that the main capital cost per day was trending closer to 2000. Uh, now it's closer to the mid-2000s, but I, I would point out that that includes drill pipe replacement. And in a lot of cases, we are getting customers to to pay for excess wear on drill pipes. 
and so we're it's showing up as a higher cost in uh, in maintenance capex, but then we're recouping it in margin. Got it. Okay, so drill pipe and some other things. What are what are besides drill pipe? Uh, what is, what have been kind of the big the big drivers in terms of the maintenance capital number increasing? So it would be mud pumps, mud pump maintenance, uh, engines, top drive, all the critical components on the rig. The, the repair costs have gone up. If you think about R and M, you've got uh, you've got consumable components when you do repairs, you, which have a little bit of inflation in them, and then you have labor. And so labor's up across the board, and that's what's driving it. Yeah, got it. And and just la one last one on any on any activations that you might see in the U.S. Is there are we talking about any substantial capital requirements to bring to bring any any of those rigs back? Or are they all pretty pretty warm still? Likely not uh, not much maintenance capital. Uh, we might have a little bit of operating expense, and if there's upgrades associated with the reactivation, there'd be some upgrade capital. But 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 you make you make the correct point that a lot of these rigs were working six months or a year ago and they're not going to be the same type of reactivations that we had to put forward at the end of twenty one and beginning of twenty two. Okay, thanks very much. Our next question comes from Cole Pereira with Stiefel. Your line is open. Uh, afternoon all. Uh, I just want to start uh, on the margin front in the U.S. Uh, so it sounds like some of the costs there. We're going to reoccur in Q4. You know, is there anything transitory that is in both Q3 and Q4, or you know, in the event that the that the rig count in the U.S. doesn't increase, is that kind of a reasonable run rate uh, going forward? Just as from your last call, I mean, your your rig count in the U.S. is down a little bit, but the margin outlook is quite a bit lower. Right. So, so I think that they will the cost will trend down a bit more in, in Q1 regardless of whether we increase our rig count. Uh, there, if you think about it, if you have a lower rig count, you're absorbing a bit more fixed costs, but also if you have a, a high maintenance cost on a rig, you know, if you have a critical component that needs to be replaced, it, it just shows up more, uh, it's, it's more prevalent in the average operating cost if you're running fewer rigs. And so we've, we've had a few of those. Uh, where we just had a higher higher R and M cost on a particular rig, and it it just shows up a little bit um, a little bit more in the in the daily operating cost because of it. So we, we do think that some there's there's a bit of transitory cost in there, and we should see it trending down a bit more in Q1. Okay, got it. And then coming back to uh, shareholder returns, you talked about it a little bit, and there's obviously a few different ways activity can go next year, but Free cash flow, you know, should be pretty strong uh, in any reasonable scenario. I mean, from your standpoint, is it, you know, you maybe think about paying down, call it $150 million of debt or something in that range and should have a lot left over, and then you think about growth, CapEx, and kind of put the put the rest in the buyback? Yes, so we'll put forward our, our capital allocation targets at the beginning of next year. I think, in general, you're, you're thinking about it right, correctly, Cole. Um, the... You know, we will continue our debt reduction uh, schedule. We will have capital allocated towards share buybacks. And then I would look at our growth capital the, the same way that we've, we've always looked at it. We're going to look for uh, opportunities to spend upgrade capital matched to contracts where we get that capital paid back. And to the extent that there's opportunity to do that in the market, we'll, we'll pursue it. Got it. Thanks. And you've done a few of these bolt-ons now. Uh, how do you think about further consolidation just as uh, part of the overall PD strategy? You know, I think um, we've demonstrated over the past couple of years that uh, if we can be opportunistic, we will. But uh, really clearly, it's not one of our top three strategic priorities. So I don't think we're going to pivot and all of a sudden become highly uh, acquisitionally focused. We like the, uh, the stability of the strong balance sheet. But uh, uh, Jerry, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. I, I, it's, it's important to note that when we executed the High Arctic acquisition, we were able to remain committed to our debt reduction target for uh, 2021 and 2022. And if you look at what we're what we've communicated on this conference call, that we're going to complete the CWC acquisition and still meet our debt reduction targets for this year, it shows you where our priorities are to get the balance sheet in order. And we're, we're in a, we're in a 
favorable place right now where we've got some flexibility where we can do some of these uh, tuck in acquisitions, but debt reduction is still going to be the number one uh, number one focus of the company for the next year or two. Got it. Okay, that's all for me. Thanks. I'll turn it back. Thank you, Cole. Our next question comes from Makar Syed with ATB Capital Markets. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, Kerry, uh, do you expect uh, shortfall revenues in Q4? Yes, they will be similar to what we what we reported in Q3 in the kind of $6 million range, U.S. And, and when do they fall off? Is uh, Q, Q4 going to be the last quarter for those, or do you expect them next year as well? Uh, it, it, we might have a little bit at the beginning of next year, but but the bulk of this you know, this level of IBC revenue will, will fall off in, in Q4 or after Q4. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, you know, as the CWC uh, rigs uh, get on the – on the payroll in, uh, in next year in the U.S., how would those impact your daily operating costs and daily uh, rig rates? I think it's a little bit too early to talk about how that's going to impact our, our daily operating margins and rates. We're, we're um, planning to close the acquisition here in the next couple of weeks, and, and we'll be able to talk about that a bit more clearly. Okay. So let's let's assume then without CWC uh, on your own fleet, uh, when do you expect U.S. margins to bottom? Well, they're they're they could be bottoming right now. We're not seeing much of a much of a change from Q3 to Q4. Uh, it just depends on whether uh, the rig count continues to trend up in, in Q1. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Well, Carl, I might answer that um, kind of focused on what you model for rig count next year. But if you're modeling the rig count to move up in Q1, then I think that rates are that margins are bottomed. Yeah, uh, that's, that's good to hear. And, and then Kevin, uh, you know, you touched upon these uh, big mergers that are happening, and then you know. It, it was mentioned in one case that they they would be looking at these um, four mile type laterals, and some other companies have talked about that, those as well. Uh, what type of rig would be required to drill that? I, I imagine not every super triple rig can do that. There may be, um, you know, even a, a further uh, subset within super triples that would do that. So maybe could you talk about like what exactly what type of uh, equipment would be required on a rig? Yeah, a little bit I can. Uh, so we've drilled some three mile laterals. We've actually drilled a couple of four mile laterals. They've been in shallower plays, not the deeper plays. Uh, but anytime you extend the length of the well or the vertical depth of the well, either one, you're increasing the required hook load capacity for the rig. So you need to have the mast has to either be strong enough or be reinforced to be strong enough. You're increasing the amount of pipe you need to build a rack in the mast, so you have to increase the racking capacity of both the racking board and the substructure to support that pipe. Uh, and now that you've got more pipe, it's more weight, so everything has to support that weight. Uh, and then because you're drilling farther and you're adding more uh, pipe in the ground, you need more hydraulic horsepower. So you're typically going from uh, two pumps to three pumps or going from 1,600 to 2,000 horsepower mud pumps. So... Um, most of these rigs that you know in our fleet uh all of these changes for us are kind of bolt-ons we can bolt on a mast upgrade we can bolt on um, a racking capacity upgrade we can slide in a third pump slide in a fourth generator so the rig doesn't become obsolete uh but these are capital increases so to add a, a third pump and a fourth generator is over a million dollars to uh upgrade the mass capacity to handle, handle more pipe might be in our case might be less than a half million dollars uh, if you want to do all of these things together for one of our rigs, it's probably the range of anywhere from three to five million. And uh, the, the other component is the top drive usually has to have a higher torque capacity, so there's a bit of work to do in the top drive. Great. Uh, thank you very much. That, that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Bakar. Our next question comes from Sean Mitchell with Daniel Energy Partners. Your line is open. Uh, thanks, guys, for taking my question here. Um, you guys have got 
the the three rigs in Saudi, the fourth and fifth rig in Kuwait. Any thoughts around exploring other international markets? I know Luke hit Canada and U.S., but we haven't really talked about. Are, are there other opportunities international that you guys are looking at, and any color you can add? Sean, we've been uh, you know clearly focused on uh, maximizing our footprint in Kuwait and Saudi. So for sure, those two countries. We've been bidding around the uh, Gulf. We think we can support rigs in in Qatar, Bahrain, uh, you know, maybe Abu Dhabi, places like that from the base of operations we have either in Saudi or Kuwait and our regional uh, offices in Dubai. So we think the entire Gulf region is open to us. Um, we're not looking really aggressively outside the Gulf. You know, we have had inquiries from Argentina. We've had inquiries from Central Africa. Uh, I'm not anxious to see us, um, you know, in six or seven different countries around the world, but if we had a one-off chance to put a rig somewhere at a, a really good day rate, we'd look at that. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thanks, John. And I'm not showing any further questions at this time. I'd like to turn the call back over to LeVon for any closing remarks. On behalf of the team here at Precision, I'd like to thank people for joining us today, and that concludes our conference call. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's presentation. You may now just connect and have a wonderful day.